Today on Seculo, a major update, a big win for Trump in the immunity case at the U.S. Supreme Court. Keeping you informed and engaged, now more than ever, this is Seculo. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments or call 1-800-684-3110. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. All right, welcome to Seculo, folks. Well, we've got one of the two that are pending at the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, yesterday evening, a certiorari was granted. The idea that this uh, appeal for a stay from the Supreme Court on the immunity case uh, for moving forward uh, and the idea that it could be converted into an actual uh, oral argument and uh, with full briefing. And, Dad, you were talking about that yesterday fairly confidently that you thought that's why it had been taking this amount of time because in a usual stay it's either yes or no uh but they, but that because of the the uh briefing that was filed was so significant that it was like merits briefing and that the court could use that to determine whether or not they wanted to actually take this up as a writ of certiorari yeah so the court has options when they get it they a certiorari petition was not technically up there i mean so no this one is, asked for that no so here's what you had you had a well all that was pending was a motion to stay the proceedings pending the filing of a certiorari petition. Instead, the court, and of course the government objected, saying this thing needs to go to trial, Department of Justice. Right. Instead, the court, on its own motion, and we're going to break this down in the next segment, or the segment after this, we got Mike Pompeo coming up. What the court did was they converted it to a, a certiorari petition, and then the court itself granted the, wrote the question that they wanted to have answered, which is really, it happens, but it's very unusual. And we want to go to that question. It's, it's right there. I mean, this is only, it's a one pager just for people. I mean, we can and put it's up an order, a, not an opinion. Screen. This is an yeah. order. I mean, this is kind of how it comes. It's not, but all these words matter in these orders. And this is where it starts. This is the only question that should be answered in the uh, briefing and then oral yes. argument. And let me tell you something else before you go to it. And the mistake that lawyers make is they don't answer the question presented. Right. So when I just told our team for the brief we're filing, all I want to do is answer the question presented. That's what we need to do here. So this is the question presented. There's kind of two or three questions within the question. Whether and if so, to what extent does a former president enjoy presidential immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office? That is the only question presented. And, Dad, in the next segment, I don't want to do it right now, but we're going to walk through how that one question you could answer answer multi parts of it and kind of get get to where you want to be, but also then just a f determining what are official acts. I mean that is something that could go through an entire new uh, round you of course. Have, have a hearing and to determine. So, for instance, on the election issues, right. I would argue that those, of course, are official acts. The president has to on the execution clause yep. of the Constitution has to faithfully execute the laws of the United States. Yep. He believed. They were not being that they were not executed. being faithfully executed. So as president, he took action. So then the question is, and look, he, he, this we're going to really break this question down yeah. because, folks, it, to me it's signaling where this case is going. And that's why the left is going crazy right now on this. And even on CNN and MSNBC, they said this was a huge win for Trump. And it was. It wasn't what his lawyers asked for, but it's what I suspected. I said it yesterday. I think it was yesterday. I said, I believe this is what the court's going to do. It's like you almost don't want to ask the court for this because this is better than getting a stay. Yeah, because, well, and they, and they did say the mandate. So it is Nothing a, can I mean, go it, on in the district court. Right. The case has stopped. Yep. So this is the, so you've got the, we're waiting for the disqualification clause case. Still that out should of Colorado. Be, uh, hopefully tomorrow. Um, I would like to see it before Super Tuesday. Yeah, because we got an Illinois judge who did who went something the other way. wild that we'll tell you about when yeah. we come up And next. then we've now got this, So, and the ACLJ involved in all of these. Yes, folks, uh, again, we've got an Illinois judge we're going to tell you about who thought, you know what, I think I can kick Trump off the ballot. Illinois Board of, Edu uh, of Elections didn't think they could, but they decided to. And by the way, they didn't stay it, pending the Supreme Court, though I do think it will be shut down uh, fairly quickly. Uh, they are trying to, again dirty up president trump and you're seeing these elected judges do just that we will be right back on seculo continue to follow all of the updates through our social media through the broadcast and of course at aclj.org we'll be right back with mike pompeo a member of our team and at the aclj on seculo 
Breaking news from the Supreme Court about former President Donald Trump. The court just said they are taking up Mr. Trump's request to hear whether or not he is immune from prosecution. This will temporarily stop the federal election interference case against him from going to trial. The move further delaying any trial in the case, likely for months. And if Mr. Trump wins, the charges would be dismissed. Arguments now set for the week of April 22nd. An appeals court had ruled against him, saying former President Trump has become citizen Trump with all of the defenses of any other criminal defendant. But Mr. Trump hoped the Supreme Court would put that on pause, saying he was being wrongly prosecuted for official acts that happened while he was still in office. Now, this is the second time the Supreme Court has rejected Jack Smith's request for the Supreme Court to just step in and decide this question of immunity once and for all so that he could move forward with this prosecution. He asked them months ago to weigh in on this issue, not to wait for this to go through the appeals process so that he could bring this case to trial swiftly, saying that it was in the public interest for this case to be tried and decided soon. I think they had to take this case. I mean, even under Supreme Court rules, when you've got an issue this tremendously significant under the Constitution that's never been decided, which this case is, that's the kind of case you want the Supreme Court to have the final say. And they've set a timeline that means they could have a decision by the end of June, which is what Jack Smith had asked for. If it's one of those biggies that we get at the very end of the term again, from there, I think the Trump team is going to argue we have pretrial motions, we have discovery that puts us through July, August, maybe September before we'd even be ready to argue this case. So uh, the early fall is very conceivable. Though. Would this decision by the court, when when they make it apply beyond just this one, beyond the January 6th case? Potentially. And I think that might be why the Supreme Court is taking it up in this way. All right, welcome back uh, to Secchio. We are joined by our senior counsel for global affairs, former Secretary of State and CIA Director Mike Pompeo and Secretary Pompeo, I think this immunity case, uh, you could speak to it very well as someone advising the president on top issues, both as a CIA director on some of the most classified um, uh, inf information and decision making and uh, uh, different kind of options available to the president. Same goes when uh, you were secretary of state. I again, very big decisions to make. The Jack Smith case against President Trump, though, took a major hit because the Supreme Court decision to rule on uh, decided that they were going to rule on presidential immunity rather than just uh, issue or not issue a stay. What are your initial thoughts on this move by the Supreme Court? Well, Jordan, I, I'm, I'm not surprised they took this up. I think this is an important case. I think this is something that needs to be decided. And I, I agree with you. The, uh, the prosecution by uh, Jack Smith uh, is going to be impacted greatly by this. Uh, but I think that's just fine. This is how this is how our legal system works. I'm glad the Supreme Court didn't just uh, push this off or uh, delay this indefinitely. I, I hope they'll take it up quickly. I'd love to see them take it up more quickly because this issue needs to be put to bed. There, there are elected officials today. There are executive branch officials today who will we, we think of this in the context of President Trump, but there are current folks, right? The Biden team is sitting there. They're facing the same risk as well. The work that they're doing can be greatly impacted by whether or not it's the case that the acts that they're taking, their their efforts to deliver on behalf of America are, are actually things that someday some attorney general or some special prosecutor or some special counsel could decide to prosecute them for. You know, Mike, I was thinking about this. I mean, you know, I was in meetings with you in, in the White House when we when you were the, serving as secretary of state. And I mean, a lot of and there's attorney client privilege issues when you're you know representing the president. But. This immunity thing is a big deal because the idea that after you leave office, which is what the Court of Appeals said, basically your immunity vanishes and you could be prosecuted for an official act that some, you know, U.S. attorney thinks is a crime would affect the advice you as the Secretary of State would be giving to the president. If you've got to look over his shoulder with a battery of lawyers every time you discuss an issue with real advice. Uh, Jay, there's no doubt about that. That is certainly true for cabinet level, senior level officials, but it's true for other seniors as well who are all going to be thinking, well, who's who's monitoring this? Who's taking notes on this? Which one of these is some prosecutor going to second guess and say, boy, what you did there was unlawful uh, to suggest as the, the appeals court did? And I, I think the Supreme Court will definitely overturn this central idea that they put forward. The idea that somehow when you leave office, you are simply now a citizen 
and have no protections for the actions that you took in your official capacity uh, would really shape conversations, actions, uh, decision-making processes, all of the things that you saw, you witnessed uh, when senior leaders are trying to do good work on behalf of America. It cannot be the case that the day that a president of the United States or the day that a cabinet official leaves office, they no longer enjoy the protection, the immunities that they had while they were in office. That just can't simply be as a matter of constitutional law or as a practical matter for, for practitioners, for those of us who are actually trying to do this. Well, you know, I was thinking about this in the context of the current administration, like you just said. If I was the Biden administration, I wouldn't be too happy with Jack Smith's argument, because if his argument's correct, when Joe Biden leaves office at 1201 on January 20th, whenever, whether it's this time or next time, well, is he going to be subject to, like, you know, I didn't enforce the border laws correctly, or so I let Americans get rid of the You got local U.S. attorneys for another administration starting. This is where no one thinks through the consequences of what they ask. But Jack Smith has a history of overreach. And I think this, is it fair to say, Mike, in your view, that this impacts the functioning of government at the highest level? 100%. 100%. You're, you're right. I, everyone puts this in the context of President Trump because that's the context in which this case has arisen. But the, the current leaders, decisions about whether people will actually decide – I think I'll take a position in the next administration, whoever's administration that is. These are all going to be impacted by whether, in fact, you are protected and you're trying to do your lawful decision-making process. Your your point's exactly right. Here's another example. Imagine that the next president comes and says, you know, the fact that you forgave billions of dollars of student loans was illegal. Indeed, the Supreme Court said it was illegal, and you went ahead and did it, and, you know, we're going to prosecute you. We're going to put you in jail for having worked on that, some official in the Department of Education or the Secretary of Education or the President himself. It it has to be the case that uh, our most senior decision makers have the uh, ability to be protected for the work that the the constitutional work they're doing while they are elected officials. Yeah, and I mean, and this is a case, of course, that goes to then is while they're elected officials and then it's the acts they did while they were elected. So because the lower court, uh, Secretary Pompeo said, you're protected while you're there, but at 12.01, when if uh, someone else is swearing in, all those protections fall off, which means they were never protections That's at all. Absurd, they were just, so. I think the Supreme Court, however they they end up with this case and whether it goes back on other things on official versus unofficial acts and how you define that, that sentence right there cannot be the law of the land. No, Jordan, that's nonsense. It, it can't be the case that protected acts become unprotected the moment you step out of office. That's that's no protection as a matter. As a matter of fact, and I, 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 am, I am very confident that the Supreme Court will rule directly on that point and rule that that's absurd. I think that I suspect the way that, you know, it's interesting history in this case because they weren't asking for a cert petition, the Trump's lawyers, they were asking for a stay. And I, I said on the broadcast, our broadcast yesterday, Mike, that I expected exactly this to happen, um, that they were going to, um, or the day before, actually. Yeah, I said because it kept taking – and the longer it got, first you start thinking, normally they refer this to the court, and then an order comes a couple of days later. Here, we don't even show on the docket sheet that's on the Supreme Court's official website whether it was referred to the court, which we now know it was, because it says the application to stay was presented to the chief and referred to the court. Um, it was the special counsel requested that they treat the stay application as a petition for certiorari, because at that point, they were trying to see if they can make up any time. What I don't think they expected was that that would be granted and argument would not be until April 22nd, likely a decision last week of the term, which is usually the end of June or the 1st of July. And and I think the way they wrote that question, to me, it's indicating that there are at least five justices that think the D.C. Circuit got it wrong. If the opinion were to stand, though, Mike, if this D.C. Court of Appeals opinion were to stand, how would have that affected your ability, without you know getting into details, of communicating with the former pre- when you were when you were when he was president and you were the Secretary of State, one of the highest ranking officials in the United States? How would have that affected the functioning of your communications with him? Jay, I I, I think about the fact that we already have so many lawyers in the U.S. government uh, controlling and shaping how work happens. This would this would put be that on steroids. Now, every senior official and indeed presidents and their national security advisors and the White House team around them and folks like you, Jay, who are working to try and help presidents effectuate their policies, either as personal counsel or advisors, 
it, it would shape everything. It would it would create a monkey wrench in the system of staggering proportions because everyone would realize that the actions that they were taking in the, some of the most difficult conflicts, some of the most difficult complex legal issues, some of the most difficult conflicts, constitutional issues, every one of those was subject to challenge. And the moment that they walked out the door at noon on the 20th of January when their term in office was over, they were subject to criminal prosecution. It would, it would create a, a, a train wreck for decision making for every administration, not just a Trump administration or a Republican administration. Secretary Pompeo, as always, we appreciate you joining us part of our team at the ACLJ as a senior counsel for global affairs with all that insight into what it is to be a cabinet level advisor, both in the, you know, the seriousness of issues you're advising on as CIA director and secretary of state and why this case is so important long term. I think when you when you appeal, take things to the Supreme Court, they don't just think in President Trump and they don't think in just President Trump and Biden and, and Jack Smith. They think we're going to issue something that could have long term effects on how a president is able to do their job and those around him. So thank you, Secretary Pompeo, for joining us. And Dan, I mean, that's that's, I think, what they don't sometimes realize when they're taking it to the U.S. Supreme Court is they think big. Well, they think big and they think because, institutionally long. Yeah. So, you know, John Roberts as the chief justice is looking at this and saying, this is going to affect the operations of government here. So, folks, this is becoming this is a huge case, not just for President Trump, but for the functioning of the executive branch of the government. Now, we've got a little bit of experience with that, Jordan and I, because we had the three cases involving the president and the separation of powers with the functioning of the executive branch of government at the Supreme Court when he was president. We argued right here, actually, because we had to do it during COVID. And so this is a natural follow up for us in this. What I want to do in the next segment is really break this down because yeah, the question there's a because commentators who I respect that are friends of ours are, are are getting really confused here and I've been doing Supreme Court practice for 40 years so I'm going to break this down line by line if you're watching on any of our social media feeds right now and a lot of you are we encourage you to like it share it with your friends uh, so we have more people involved in the conversation but I'm going to break this down literally I'm going to go line by line in this order and we're going to break down what it means all right folks you don't want to miss that of course Stay updated at aclj.org. If you're on YouTube, make sure you subscribe because we've got more cases we're awaiting at the uh, U.S. Uh, Supreme Court. I mean, obviously the big case on the 14th Amendment, Section 3. Now we have a briefing schedule and another oral argument and another Trump case before the U.S. Supreme Court April in 22nd. this term. Next month, uh, the briefing due from us is due on uh, March uh, 19th. I mean, very so uh, very, very soon. We're our team to our lawyers right now yeah, while we're on here. Our team is already on it. So that's what you're doing when you support the work of the ACLJ at ACLJ.org. Uh, and our team was already on it last night, uh, getting the team together to prepare that brief that we'll be filing at the Supreme Court. We'll be right back taking your questions. Jordan Seculo, Executive Director of American Center for Law and Justice. Jordan, thanks so much. This is essentially a win, though, at least yesterday for Trump, right? This is a bigger win than getting the stay, just to make clear to everyone out there. A stay, uh, again, is uh, usually pretty temporary. You're looking at a, a specific issue, which the court will then uh, decide on whether just a case can move forward. Now they've decided to take the case as a whole, and they also wrote the question presented very specifically. Can you be held criminally for official acts as president? And so they're going to look to official acts and then and only those, and can you help be held criminally for that? Now, you pointed out the key victory here is whatever happens in that case, uh, ultimately at the U.S. Supreme Court, will probably not affect Donald Trump at all. It will be impossible. I mean, it would be a miscarriage of justice. It would be against Department of Justice policies to start this trial where you will likely not have an opinion. I'm betting until the last week of, of June, which is the court usually is done by them with issuing opinions, or at the latest, the first week of July. Right. So that means no trial could be concluded. It would just be the government and the Department of Justice, which has a policy against anything that could be seen as a interfering in the election. So we're ready to go on this. ACLJ can't wait to file on this as well. They're gonna be very cautious. They're going to look to specifically what the Court of Appeals did. And I think the Court of Appeals, and we will look for this in the actual oral arguments here and some of the briefing that's coming. The Court of Appeals wrote this line. The president loses it all immunity that he had as president at 12.01 the day he leaves as president of the United States. That 
has far-reaching issues, not just for President Trump, for past presidents and future presidents. All right, folks, we are going to start taking your calls on this, too, about uh, how important this issue, uh, this, this uh, uh, again, Sir Shorey being granted in this immunity case is uh, for uh, President Trump and how it, uh, again, it sets back Jack Smith. I mean, Axios, at least being honest, the Supreme Court hands Trump a huge win before it even hears his case. And you can walk through that. As, you know, it's just two paragraphs, but it really gets to a couple things. One uh, of course, there's no stay because you don't need a stay because right. nothing is going to happen in this case line line. at all. So let's let's start with that for people. And then call us with your questions, 1-800-684-3110. Remember, this is the case where it was about obstructing acts of Congress, the, all of that. It was, Which is also at the Supreme Everything right up now. to the line of it was not, they did not charge uh, bring a charge of insurrection. I always want to make that clear. But there are, yeah, someone is charging, is already challenging at the U.S. Supreme Court uh, one of the uh, charges here, which, uh, which, which, is, which are two counts for President yeah, Trump. Yeah. So let me break it down. Let's start with the first sentence. Yep. You want you read it. So I'll preserve yep. my voice. Yep. Just go first sentence, and then I'll so, explain it. Okay. So it says the application for a stay presented to the Chief Justice is referred to him uh, by him to the court. Okay. So normally you get that order, Jordan, and our audience within 24 hours of when you file the application for a stay. That did not happen here. They they stopped. They did not. There was no evidence, at least on the record, that the court keeps where it says refer to the court for a stay. There was no indication that that happened. I said on the broadcast, I think Wednesday or Tuesday, that I expected that that did happen. So we now know that the application, because the chief justice on his own could have dealt with the stay, but he referred it to the court. So that meant all nine justices got the stay application. Okay. Next sentence. All right. The special counsel's request to treat the stay application as a petition for writ of certiorari is granted, and that petition is granted limited to the following question. Don't do the question yet. So this was interesting. When the, Remember, Jack Smith in December tried to jump over the Court of Appeals. Yeah. Supreme Court said no. Then the Court of Appeals ruled, and then they took the Trump's people took it up as a stay, not a certiorari petition. Just they wanted it stopped, and they were going to file a certiorari petition. Jack Smith said in... His response will at least treat the, the stay as a cert petition, which is not an unusual practice. They did that. So the court then, it takes four justices to grant a stay, uh, to grant a certiorari petition. There were at least four votes at that point to hear it. But then the next sentence says the petition is granted limited to the following question. And what you read in a minute, that question was drafted by the Supreme Court, yep. not the parties. Right. So normally, like here, and I'm holding up our red brief, and we're, we're counsel of record for the Colorado GOP on the merits in the case involving disqualification, 14th Amendment. We had in there a question presented. Did the Colorado Supreme Court err in ordering President Trump excluded from the 2024 presidential primary ballot? That's the question presented that the parties put together. This one, the court drafted. Now go ahead and read yeah, so it. And we're going to break it. this down. This is very important. And then again, uh, yes, yeah, so we're going to break it down for you, but let's just read the single question presented, whether and if so, to what extent does a former president enjoy presidential immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office? All right, this is very important. So the court drafts the question. First thing they say, is, the question is whether, so in other words, is there, and if so, to what extent, you got to focus on the, and if so, what to what extent. That indicates to me that, a number of members may not be a majority. I don't know that. But a number of members of the court thinks there is immunity. Right. Now the question is whether there is immunity, but also what is the extent of that immunity? And does a former president, this was the thing I, I said the D.C. Court of Appeals got wrong, enjoy that presidential immunity uh, for official acts during his tenure? The answer to that has to be yes. Because if it's not yes, it means that any president could be brought up by any U.S. attorney, on criminal, former president, on criminal charges. So we just had Mike Pompeo on. You're talking about a senior advisor to the president, right? I mean, he was the secretary of state. Or how about us? Counsel to the president. Yeah. And we're giving advice. And we say, no, this doesn't violate 18 U.S.C., whatever the code section is. That's a criminal code. Well, 
under this rule, under the D.C. Circuit, at 1201, he became Citizen Trump. Fact is, he doesn't become Citizen Trump. Still a former president of the United States. Is President Bush going to be signed because sued or criminally because there were no weapons of mass destruction? Or how about, you know, President Obama? I could go through all of them. So I think the court got that wrong. But the way they drafted the question, whether and if so, to what extent does the former president enjoy this immunity for official acts? So here's the real question. Did the district court develop a record on whether these were official acts or not? And I think and the answer to that is no, they did not. So. That's where I think this ends up going back down. That's why I don't think this case goes to trial, even if he lost this year. And I don't think he's going to lose. Go ahead. So, I mean, you think, uh, again, that they end up sending it back to decide what you're going to say there is immunity. Right. Now you've got to determine are these official acts. What you're, what you're saying. We're and criminal. on the election issues, which is what the January 6th stuff is, I would say that goes under the execution clause of the United States. The president is commander in chief has to faithfully execute the laws of the United States. He thought they were not faithfully executed. Next yeah. line. Yep. Okay. So this is important too. Without expressing a view on the merits, this court directs the court of appeals to continue withholding issuance of the mandate until the sending down of the judgment of this court. The application for a stay is dismissed as moot. Okay. So they, they decided we don't need an application for a stay because we're hearing the case that meant there were five votes to say no mandates issued. What does that mean? They're, when they say without expressing a view on the merits, they're not making a merits decision whether it was criminal act or not a criminal act. They're making a legal determination. That's what the court's going to do as to does the immunity apply and what is the extent of that immunity and does it apply and this only if in the case of official acts. The district court's going to have to make the determination whether these were official acts or not. The interesting thing is the mandate, um, the court froze the court of appeals and the district court. Nothing can proceed in these lower courts while this is pending. So the case has stopped. No discovery, no motion practice, no witness exchanges, no no evidence exchanges. The case is frozen. It's not going to be the next sentence talks about argument is going to be the week of April 22nd, which which is the last week that they hear all arguments. They didn't expedite this like they did in Colorado. Colorado, they had that argument, remember, on, on February 8th. I mean, it moved in record time. Um, here they're not doing that. It's still the last week of the term. So we've got to file our brief on March 19th, which our team's already working on. But what it means is there's likely not a decision in this case until the end of June, the 1st of July. So the idea that there would be a trial in August or September is not going to happen. I mean, I don't think Judge Shunkin would even do it. I just don't think she would do it. Even the the, the, the liberals, uh, Eli Honig said yep. this uh, today, a bite uh, 22. This is an argument that we don't know the answer to. I mean, the Supreme Court has recognized a form of civil immunity for certain federal officials, including the president, going back 40 or so years, so long as they're acting within the scope of their federal job. What we don't know is, A, is there any form of criminal immunity? The Supreme Court's ever- yeah, okay, so that was the wrong bite. Do you guys have the right bite set up now? We don't have time for it. We don't have time for, well, we don't have time for it. We'll get we'll back it. to the second half hour, because what they're saying... There could be some, like, sliver. That's, like, their liberal hope of, of, again, that, like, someone would try to start this. When you and- when you hear the bite we want to hear, he says, clearly, this is a big win for Trump. Yeah. So we'll play that when we come back from the break. Share this with your friends. Support the work of the ACLJ at ACLJ.org. You talk about that. Yeah, I mean, again, how things shift so quickly in these legal matters from Georgia to... Fascinating time. To, yeah, I mean, it, it is. Tomorrow's and- the closing arguments in the Georgia case. Yeah, right. And so we'll get that next week. And then we know there's going to be another... Trump case at the U.S. Supreme Court we're filing it. We're right back on Secular. The U.S. Supreme Court handing Donald Trump the gift of time. The justices agreeing to decide whether the Republican frontrunner should be immune from federal charges. In a one-page order, the high court saying it will hear arguments in the case the week of April 22nd. Whatever happens in that case, uh, ultimately at the U.S. Supreme Court, will probably not affect Donald Trump at all. It will be impossible mm-hmm. I mean, it would be a miscarriage of justice. It would be against Department of Justice policies to start this trial where you will likely not have an opinion. I'm betting until the last week of, of June, which is the court usually is done by them with issuing opinions, or at the latest, the first week of July. Election aside, you know, if you just say to the judge, given the volume of discovery, we cannot be ready 
to try this case on that time and you know the defendant has a right to be able to be prepared for trial yeah you know, that's something that's going to be very difficult to say no to keeping you informed and engaged now more than ever this is seculo and now your host jordan seculo all right, welcome back uh, to Seculo. We are taking your phone calls as well at 1-800-684-3110. So we have gotten one of the decisions out of the Supreme Court we are awaiting involving uh, President Trump. This was the special counsel in the immunity case uh, where there was an application for a stay presented. The special counsel said, well, maybe instead of a stay, we could get uh, certiorari granted on this case. But I bet the special counsel did not like what they actually received no. when they got certiorari granted, which is the question that got presented leads to a potential for a Supreme Court decision, even that doesn't side with either the special counsel or President Trump yet, they could restart this from the very, very beginning over just a finding, which I don't even know if courts will want to do, official acts versus unofficial acts of an incumbent president. Which, which very while he's president. Not easy. Well, I mean, you got it raises a separation of powers issue. Right. Who decides what's an official act? A court? Four years after the fact? Yeah. So here's what it, but remember what they wrote. This is what the Supreme Court wrote. Whether, and if so, to what extent, does a former president enjoy presidential immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office? If it's an official act, how could you be criminally prosecuted? The Constitution requires that the president faithfully execute the laws of the United States. President Trump was convinced that there was election irregularities. Put aside whether there was or wasn't. He was convinced of it. I'm, I'm sure he would pass a lie detector test, no doubt. Um, the idea now is, for Jack Smith, they're looking at this saying, we got two problems, not just one. We have two. One, we have another case involving a January 6th defendant who raised that the obstruction of Congress statute violated the First Amendment. Two justices, two judges of the D.C. Circuit disagreed with him, but Judge Katzis agreed with him. That case is now at the Supreme Court, too. That's two of the four charges against President Trump. Then add this to it, and you got a real... Jack Smith suffered a huge loss. Let's play... This is what CNN's commentator, Ellie Honig, said on air. Take a listen. This is clearly a big win for Donald Trump and a major setback for Jack Smith. In terms of what I think is the big question on people's mind, is there any chance now that this case gets tried before the election? I think my answer is there is the slightest sliver of a chance, but no more than that. No way. Here's why. The motion practice coming out of this opinion. Remember what happened when we did the let's take about talk about our experience. We did the we did three cases for President Trump in at the Supreme Court on issues similar. It was it was um, document, document requests, requests and pres records. temporary presidential immunity. And even though the in the D.A. case, the court said it didn't require heightened scrutiny. The court then said, though, that the president, 9-0, to they said this, has the authority to go into federal court, challenge these constitutionally, and can assert that it's interfering with his function as president. Do you know how long it took Jordan to get that resolved later? Another year right. to get it all the way through the system. Then we delivered the tax returns. What did you hear about the tax returns? Nothing. But the point is, the way this works, there's no way this case can go to Their sliver of hope is zero. Right. I mean, okay. and that's because... First of all, if they did it, and they said we're going to go to trial in October while the man's running for president of the United States, the Republican nominee, you'd have a, a revolt in this country. You can't do that. I don't think that. Joe it's Biden not, would want it either. I think no, it, I don't think I he think would that either. helps president... It actually would you know, help Joe Biden needs to be thinking... Trump. You know what Joe Biden needs to do? Call Merrick Garland and say, hey, your position is going to impact me right. and my administration. Especially when I got Why my are you son doing having this? to testify, my whole family having to testify, yes. got a special counsel on me, and now if he beats me, what are they going to do to me? Exactly. Family. This is a terrible pres precedent for any president of the United States. Yeah, th and at the ACLJ, we have been very protective of the executive branch of government and the separation of powers. And I'm telling our audience right now, we've got a team, a team that has represented this president before, putting together an amicus brief filed by the American Center for Law and Justice, letting the court know our view on this, and we've got the experience to back it up. We've actually been before the court on these, these issues. These issues. So I believe they will take notice of, of uh, what we write in that brief. And that's because of your support of the ACLJ. We want you to stay with us, too. We are awaiting one more big case out of the U.S. Supreme Court, the 14th Amendment, Section 3 case. And we saw this 
judge in Illinois decide they didn't care about the Supreme Court about to issue an opinion. They're going to kick President Trump off for now. But it's not a Super Tuesday state. We'll explain that when we get back as well. The great defenders of democracy have now kicked Trump off another state ballot. Of course, this happened in Cook County. And Illinois Circuit Judge Tracy Porter has ruled that former President Trump is disqualified from the state's March 19th primary ballot and the general election over the, quote, anti-insurrection clause. This judge in Cook County, Illinois, is writing quite clearly her decision here that the Illinois State Board of Election shall remove Donald J. Trump from the ballot for the general primary election on March 19th, upcoming in a couple weeks, or cause any votes cast for him to be suppressed. Now, there's some things in this decision today that are going to put that on hold initially. But, Aaron, it's quite a clear decision. And this decision from Illinois, it hops on board of what the Colorado Supreme Court has already done and said. Illinois has long, and especially Cook County, long been heavy-handed with ballot access. I had to go into the federal district court there to challenge the constitutionality of ballot access law, another heavy-handed move they made. They slammed them. They were so adamant about it. When I went to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, they sent six lawyers in to argue against me, and they lost again. They're going to lose this time. It's horrible. It sends a terrible message to the American people. Why are they afraid of the ballot? The ballot is what really makes this country work. Well, the arrogance of this is appalling and and waiting until this late in the day to do it, giving the president, the former president, just until Friday to file an appeal to the Supreme Court. It's already Wednesday. The Supreme Court heard an appeal of the Colorado decision on that, and it seemed like a majority of justices uh, were not buying that argument. And so it's widely expected that fairly soon the Supreme Court is going to come out with an opinion saying that Donald Trump can't be disqualified Uh, from the ballot on those grounds. So this Illinois uh, decision may ultimately be moot, but we'll have to see exactly what the Supreme Court does. Even as we await the U.S. Supreme Court, which it could be at any time, the way that we got the... This, Amendment. the Supreme Court, the uh, stay mooted out. The I think we're getting the opinion on the immunity, on the disqualification case, probably tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, if it's not tomorrow, it's Monday. Likely. Yeah, because then it's Super Tuesday. Yeah, they got to have it. Yeah, on. and I think that's just not right. So, again, you know, you've got judges. I want to take the call from, and we are taking your call. If you've got questions about all this, because I, I know that we go through it, we kind of say, all right, there's this, there's that, there's this, there's that, this, that, there's four parts, this one question. If you need us to slow it down, or if you've got a question about this part, or that, or why do you think this won't end up in court and you're hearing something different on the left and you're hearing something different on the right, give us a call, 1-800-684-3110. That's why we're here for you live to answer your questions. Let's go to Faye in South Carolina on line one. Hey, Faye. Hi. Um, thank you guys for what you do. And uh, I know we're waiting on the Supreme Court to know whether Trump can be taken off the ballot. And I'm very concerned with what I heard that Illinois is now trying to do. Can you tell me if that's possible or not for them to be able to take right. him off the ballot? So, so what we have here is a a Cook County Circuit judge. They are this one ended up being appointed because there was there was not it wasn't election time yet, and then she will have to run uh, for reelection. So they they don't run as partisan, but she is known to be a, a Democrat. I want to put that out there. It was two pair two. Uh, uh, it's not even really two paragraphs, one paragraph and, and a few sentences, uh, basically using the Colorado reasoning. And CC, she decided that even though um, in Colorado they stayed their decision pending the Supreme Court, she wouldn't do that. Yeah, this is just pending an appeal to, in their system, in the Illinois system. And what is really interesting is, again, this is the 14th Amendment question, which is before the, the Supreme Court. Right? Um, but she finds that, and again, It's all about insurrection, whether he committed insurrection. And, of course, as we've pointed out over and over again, he's never even been charged with insurrection, let alone convicted. Jack Smith never brought a count on insurrection. No other U.S. attorney has. Right. So in this case, this Cook County Circuit judge says, well, guess what? The hearing officer of the election board, the hearing officer. Okay, explain to people what a hearing officer is. Yeah, He's so not like administrative. An administrative officer under the elections board. So he's even under 
the elections board with the elections board said he's not guilty. He remains on the ballot. It's we can't bring this. Trump, of course, is going to be on the ballot. But the hearing officer is the one that supposedly listened to the evidence and came to this conclusion by a preponderance of the evidence. Of course, President Trump engaged in insurrection. So we have a hearing officer that is keeping a presidential candidate off the ballot in Cook County, Illinois. This is exactly what we warned the Supreme Court about in our brief for the Colorado GOP. You let one administrator, Secretary of State, hear a hearing officer to determine if a presidential candidate can be on the ballot. I mean, think about this for a moment. And here the election committee, as you said, said no. Right. The board disagreed with the hearing officer. Yeah, the board disagreed, said they were not in the right place. And there was, and then, you know, out of nowhere, case gets brought. And instead of saying, you know what, I don't need to hear this case or issue an opinion on this case because the Supreme Court has taken it up. No, Trump, you got to pay for an appeal. Uh, by, While it, it, the case is, exact same case is been argued, submitted, yeah. and is at the Supreme Court with a and decision coming. Their own taxpayers' years. money too by even holding this. I mean, you're you're paying for this this judge to do this to put all this together as an Illinois and Cook County taxpayer for no reason at all because the Supreme Court is going to answer the question for the entire country uh, very soon. And then I mean, what what I think is just absurd here is this is a state that doesn't vote until March 19th. I mean, so this is like not around the corner. This, I mean, it's, it's sued, well, but we all expect the Supreme Court to be out before Super Tuesday. There's something else absurd in this opinion, and Cece and I debated yeah, whether yeah. to even discuss it, That's but I think we should. The order, actually, the judge yeah. got the law backwards. Right. Go ahead. So it's confusing, but the judge is saying That's what we're doing that the candidate, yes. that Trump, fails to meet the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment disqualification disqualification provision so if he fails to meet the disqualification provision that means he's qualified but then in the very next sentence she says and his name should be removed from the ballot so they don't even you know what it tells me maybe it was a typo could be but you know what it tells me they have no idea what the law is and then you get these circuit court judges making decisions for the country could you imagine not having votes in illinois not a state that the president's likely to win but it, it affects the tally of the votes Doing this while a Supreme Court case is pending, and then I'm going to have her read this again. I'm CC read this again. Getting the law actually, ba- I hesitated to do this, but it shows you. It does show you the absurd nature of what is happening here. Right. So in the order, it says the respondent candidate, which is Trump, Trump fails to meet the Section Three of the Fourteenth Amendment's disqualification right provision. Okay. So if you fail to meet it. That means you're not subject to disqualification because you didn't commit insurrection. So the next sentence should say, therefore, he can be on the ballot. Right. But it doesn't. But it does not. And his name should be removed from the ballot. So, I mean, Jordan, what this is saying is these judges are making these huge consequential decisions and have no clue what the law actually is. Clueless. It's political. Yeah. Let's go to Bill in Wyoming on line two. Hey, Bill. Hey, Bill. Yeah, thanks for letting me ask you this question. Sure. Uh, what happened to Michigan where they uh, eliminated uh, Biden? Couldn't they do this in response to this judge's uh, opinion and knock him off the primary as well? Well, here's the thing. The, the judge's decision in Illinois just affects Illinois. It does not affect another state. But, you know, here's my answer to that. That would be ridiculous, too. That would be ridiculous that a judge could remove the Democratic nominee for president based on whatever the allegation is that thinks he's disqualified. It's not – that is – The 14th Amendment was designed to restrain the states during Reconstruction after the Civil War from doing things like interfering with elections because they were concerned that Southern senators being reelected would put in somebody, you know, in their electors or in their Congress that, you know, took up an oath against the United States. I don't want to get back into the whole breakdown of what we argued in the case, but it's not good for any system. That would be like Texas saying, you know what, we're getting invaded down here. And we, we're not putting Biden on the ballot because we think he's he's causing an insurrection. Right. And I think you saw that with even the liberal justices. When you if you listen to the 14th Amendment or oral argument, you saw that even the liberal justices yeah. were saying this would be chaotic. If you let someone like a hearing officer or a secretary of state in all of these states make a determination for the qualification of president, it would be complete chaos. And again, you had liberal justices Arguing that point. Yeah, I mean, 
his lawyers were not particularly helpful on the on that argument. I'm talking about the president's lawyers. At the end of the day, I think we're winning it. I think they're going to say the president's not an officer of the United States because, as John Roberts has said, we don't elect officers, and that ends it. But, as Cece just pointed out, this is the example. I almost feel like if I knew this case was taken another week, you know what I'd file? A supplemental brief. In fact, it may be worth doing it anyways because this show and, – and put the order – the, do we have the order on the screen? Do we have it? I'm, I'm holding it in my hand. No, that's not it. I'm talking about the, that's all right. And I'd attach the order to this, to the supplemental, and say, hey, you know, Supreme Court, while you're debating this, another judge did a crazy, and this judge said uh, he failed to meet the Section 3 disqualification provision. Thus, he's qualified, but they say, no, he's not. So this is why you need a rule. You need a rule the right way because you got judges making these decisions and they don't even know what they're making. And that's the real problem with all of this. So let's go ahead and take Victoria's call. Yeah, Victoria's calling from North Carolina on line three. Hey, Victoria, welcome to Seculo. You're on the air. Hi. Um, I was wondering about President Trump filing for immunity in Island Cannon courtroom this past week. Is, is that going to affect it? it? There's not an immunity claim there right now. Now, it would be interesting. I think the disposition of this case may impact that um, because – there again, it's it's that is a records dispute. I think that case is moving much slower. And the, the case that's got the liability, in my view, uh, for President Trump is the January 6th case, which I thought was very thin to begin with. And there was never a charge of insurrection. And two of the counts are up at the Supreme Court now on the whole issue of whether there is even a, um, a claim that there was interference with Congress, whether the statute was overbroad, restricting free speech. And... You know, Joe Biden needs to say to the Justice Department, you're killing me here. Mm -hmm. That's what he needs to be saying. You're killing the presidency. Your position you're advocating subjects me, Joe Biden, to risk on January 20th at 1201, if I'm not the president of the United States, and even if I am in four years from now, if the next team's in and it's the Republicans and they want to do the same thing. That's the problem with this. So if we put our partisan hat off and just look at this as Americans, this position is a disaster. And it's a very limited question, and it's a very narrow question. And when you start studying that question, I break that we broke that question down, it tells you what it is. We're going to take your phone calls on any of these topics, 1-800-684-3110. Yeah, if you've got questions for us about what the Supreme Court did on the immunity case, if you've got questions about, again, the 14th Amendment case still hanging out there, the Georgia, what's going on there, give us a call, one 800 Six eight four thirty one ten. You know we're not hearing a lot about Hunter Biden. Remember we were supposed to get a, a transcript within yeah, well, twenty four hours of that. Happened. We're less than twenty four hours away. Yep. Well, tell us what you think what happened when we get back because I think that's interesting because we haven't hit the twenty four hour mark. Some people thought they'd get it immediately. I said I thought it was going to take twenty four hours, and it probably looks like it will now uh, to actually get that. We'll take all those questions. One eight hundred six eight four three one one zero. This is focusing on the Joe Biden, whether there is, uh, you know, grounds for impeachment within Hunter Biden's testimony. I just really don't understand how the Democrats can deny this corruption that's happening. We've seen the text exchange from Hunter saying, I'm sitting here with my dad. He's using his dad. And then we see uh, payments to Joe Biden for some sort of loan, and they can't figure out uh, how to push back and say, here's the loan. We don't even know what the loan is about, but clearly Joe Biden is getting money for a loan. Those two things right there show corruption. Now, if the Democrats want to say Washington, D.C. is full of corruption and this doesn't rise to uh, the level of a high crime, that's a different argument because everybody's corrupt and this is not that corrupt. To be honest, Rick, right now, the Republicans handled it the right way, which is by they instead of the way Democrats rush to impeach President Trump, they're they're taking it step by step. They're making sure they can ask the people the right questions. And, and if they don't think they have enough information to take to the U.S. Senate, I don't think they will. What the Republicans have done uh, very successfully is expose the hypocrisy of Washington, D.C. We all see the evidence there. And to have the media and the Democratic operatives say, well, this doesn't go to, uh, you know, Joe Biden directly. And, and most people outside of Washington are like, 
look, this may be a Tuesday in Washington, D.C. This is a, an occurrence that happens all the time, but this doesn't happen in the real world. You don't use your dad's name when your dad is the vice president uh, of the United States to scare people into submission. And so I, I think the corruption has been exposed. We all see it. And what what we're seeing from Washington is a collective yawn that they are really not that serious about corruption. That is what the American people need to see and hear. This is focusing. Right, welcome back to Secchio. So there's one thing we have not yet hit, and that is, of course, yesterday we talked about the fact that Hunter Biden had finally come to an agreement, uh, both uh, Democrats, Republicans, and Hunter Biden's legal team, on a deposition. It involved multiple committees, Judiciary Committee, Ways and Means, uh, as well as uh, the uh, Government Reform and Affairs Committee. So they, and instead of usually staff doing it, uh, most of it's going to be members. a lot of members, and they said it would go on for, you know, for hours. It did. They usually do video. There was The decision was no video, but a transcript within, they hope, 24 hours. Now, we're not within that yet because this went on for eight, nine hours. But uh, there hasn't been much said about what was learned in the hearing. Well, I guess, well, should we play this for Matt Gaetz? Yeah, because this is Matt Gaetz, I mean, this who is, is Matt the, Gaetz, who the is, toughest guy on this stuff. If there was an, a, 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 a there kernel was a of anything kernel that of was anything helpful. good, he'd, he'd be saying it. Take a listen. There were a number of interesting moments, but perhaps none more interesting than when Hunter Biden told us that he uh, joined the Burisma board to counter Russian aggression. I, I hadn't heard that one before, that thank goodness we had Hunter Biden on the Burisma board uh, because that was uh, central to his strategy to stand up to Vladimir Putin. Swing and a miss. That's what this was. If that's the best Swing that- and a miss. And I'm telling this to my Republican friends. Don't rely on tent. Who was the lawyer that said... Don't get so excited about this 1023. I'm not going to say, I'm not claiming the credit, but can we claim the credit? I said it on the air. You kept warning people over and over and over again. The 1023 is nothing. It's a statement that somebody makes. It can be totally false. Guess what? In that particular case, about Biden getting $10 million, it was. It's criminal because that person was a paid informant with uh, multiple international uh, 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 citizenships who also got paid by the FBI, and they've been arrested twice the last two weeks. We, We have talked about the overreach issue that Democrats made on the impeachment. But the Republicans can be guilty of the same thing here if they're not very careful. And Hunter Biden answered eight hours worth of questions. I told you, folks, he's got a great lawyer. Smart people get great lawyers. And Abby Lowell is a great lawyer and answered questions. And the takeaway is if that is all Matt Gates has, I can imagine this was a, a swing and a miss. The 1023, a swing and a miss. So let me tell, breaking news alert. According to our view, Joe Biden's being impeached for nothing. Okay, he's not going to be impeached. It didn't happen. So this is like a waste of taxpayer money in some sense. Well, and it makes you wonder, you know, what information are they relying on? Obviously, they think they have some information, but then when they, you know, do these interviews and and questioning, it doesn't seem like the, the information they're getting pans out. So, you know, they just need to be smarter on the front end. Yep. I want to play something for you that I argue at the Supreme Court because it's very germane to this. I warn the Supreme Court that if you don't have some type of immunity, we call it a temporary presidential immunity, that any presidents could be bantered about from north to south and east to west. Those weren't my, I said those words, but it was actually Thomas Jefferson. Let me play, this is from the Supreme Court of the United States. New oral argument. Here you go. Uh, interested in whether or not you can point us to some express language. <laughs> at the founding or during the ratification process that uh, provides for this immunity? Well, uh, there's a couple. uh, There was a colloquy between Vice President, ultimately Vice President Adams and Senator Ellsworth, where they talked about process against the president, and they took the position that any process against the president would be constitutionally problematic. Thomas Jefferson, of course, uh, wrote uh, in the letters he had regarding subpoenas that were issued in the Burr trial that allowing uh, local magistrates to bander about a sitting president from north to south and east to west uh, would interfere with the president's responsibilities. And as this court just in the previous argument just stated, the burdensome nature of this is categorical. It's not you can't just look at the one subpoena. It is the potential for 2300 DAs or just one percent of them. 23 DAs issuing process against the president. But the concern over interference from our founding with the president's responsibilities uh, was discussed, and that's why in the Constitution there's process to deal with it. 
which is exactly basically the same issue here. So let's go ahead and take some phone calls. Yeah, Ralph in Texas on line one. He's listening on radio. Hey, Ralph, welcome to Secular. Yeah, you're on the air. My call. Sure. Uh, my question is, is with them taking Trump and removing him from the ballots, <clears throat> how is that not like election interference on their part? I think we're going to get allowing an answer that from the vote? Supreme Court soon that if you try to do that, it is. It is, absolutely. I think it's right on election interference. I don't think you could get more intentional election interference than that. The, so the, the way the process works, the party nominates, right? So they run, and there's a there's in the primary, the can, varied candidates or a caucus. The idea that an individual or even a group, of, even a board of election supervisors could then remove that candidate because they think there's been an insurrection, well, what is more interfering with an election than taking the leading candidate actually off the ballot? Right. You don't even get a chance to vote for him. Well, it, right. So, I mean, if Colorado, for instance, would have stood and they put a provision in their opinion that said if we had filed a petition for – you're hearing certiorari a lot. That's a petition to request review. They said as long as we had it up there by January 4th, he would stay on the ballot. But you still have this issue hanging out there. So we filed like December 27th. So that preserved the president's ability to be on the ballot. Uh, and then eventually President Trump's lawyers filed. So we filed, they filed. What's interesting with all of that, and I think, you know, apropos here, Jordan, is the fact that we are, though, three days from Super, three business days from Super Tuesday. Yeah. I mean, and there's no order yet from the Supreme Court, no opinion. No, and, and I mean, I, I don't think that, uh, again. I, I think we're going to win, but it, I, they need to get that opinion out tomorrow. Yes, because people would not want to, I mean, Trump's not being taken off of the Colorado ballot because they, there they stayed at pity the Supreme Court. So even if it didn't come out, those votes are still there. But then people would worry about, like, retroactively. That's just, Supreme Court does not need to let that happen. Um, early voting is basically done in most places. Some go right up until the day before, but but others have already stopped, like uh, in our state uh, we did a couple days ago. So I, I think this has got to come, to, like, t tomorrow or Monday or else – it's actually it actually is a little bit of election interference by the Supreme Court. Yeah, absolutely. Because they decided to take the case. You have they it knew hanging. There was timing on it. That's right. You have it hanging over your head. Is gotta, this person I'm going to vote for? Is he going to be on the ballot still? Well, I think the the cloud that it created. We said that in our brief. I think is significant enough that the court needs to rule before March fifth. Now, it's not you know that there's dissents or concurring opinions. It can take longer, but. It's time for that opinion to come out. This is an interesting comment by Andrew McCabe, who was the former deputy director of the FBI, because we had the question about how does it affect the documents case. I think even the left is recognizing this legal machine against Trump is crumbling against them. You got, but we even barely talked about Fonnie Willis. But let's go ahead and play the bite. If, as we, some of us think that this unlikely with this with this decision today that we're unlikely to have this case tried before the election. You're basically looking at a 50-50 chance that either of these cases will ever go to trial. There you go. So the entire legal machine that was trying to interfere with an election is crumbling. And then let's, I don't really, we got 59 seconds here. Tomorrow's going to be the closing arguments in the disaster in Fulton. The fiasco in Fulton. Yes. That's what it is. The fiasco in Fulton County. An embarrassment for Fulton County, an embarrassment for the state of Georgia. It won't be over tomorrow. It's not going to be over. That's just the closing arguments. But this is this is the prosecutors that are going after a former president of the United States and have indicted 19 other people. By the way, anybody that's pled, get your pleas revoked when this thing falls apart because this one's falling apart too. All right. Tomorrow, I think I think we get the opinion in who knows. Yeah. It may Which not is be why, one more again, you, you want to definitely subscribe, whether you're watching on YouTube, Rumble, Facebook, if you're Listen to the show on radio. Join us again at that time. Uh, we're live noon to 1 Eastern time on all the social media outlets, wherever you want to watch us or listen to us. Because, again, we got breaking news constantly happening in these court cases. Fulton County, U.S. Supreme Court affecting your votes and the next president of the United States.